colleagues who've been working on smart contracts for um, a long time. I worked on the first production smart contract back in 1989, which if any of you do the math is before blockchains were, were a thing. And um, I'll say a little bit of background about that. Um, so uh, when we were doing smart contracts initially, it was cryptographic protocols between machines. So let me, let me ask a question of the people here in the audience. Who here has interacted with a smart contract? Okay, a whole lot of the people in the audience. Now we'll get the rest of you. So what is a smart contract? Since we've been working on smart contracts before blockchain, the definition was always you know, a contract-like arrangement between essentially third parties where the execution of code handles the transfer of rights, handles the enforcement of the terms of the contract. And prior to blockchain, that meant that typically the contract was executed on some trusted third party. So a smart contract that you might recognize is eBay, PayPal, Venmo, Lyft, Uber, a much of Amazon. Several of these, of these services are acting as a trusted third party where they're executing software so that two people that are not part of that company can cooperate according to some structure that is enforced in the software. So now, you know, how many of the people that said no before thinks that they've also acted uh, uh, talked to a smart contract, right? Okay, so, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about the Agoric system in detail, and there's various, there's various uh, 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 presentations out there on the web that you can look at more of our technology stack. I'm going to talk about the topmost layer that we haven't talked about before, which affects how programs are, are, or smart contracts are written, how users interact with them, and how users interact with the system. So first let's, oh, it, uh, oh, it jumped straight ahead. All right. Um, so first it, uh, let, let's um, uh, look at current UI. So on the left, we have the MetaMask UI. And the question is, you know, what's the, what's, what's the problem with that MetaMask UI? And the answer is not that it's MetaMask. They're doing some awesome stuff with our uh, security infrastructure in their new extensibility and so forth. The problem is when I want to send money to, to Dan there, what I'm really doing is I'm sending money to a random number. And I hope that that random number has Dan on the other end. But from a UI point of view, I'm sending money to a random number. And it's not just MetaMask. It's all the UIs out there, for, to, for the most part. On the right is the Looney Wallet for Cosmos. And indeed, if I want to send, oh, I can't tell. I don't even know who that number is. But there's some random number that's going to get some money from me. And I hope it's the person that I intended to pay. But it's not just payments. It's the UIs as well. It's the, the interaction. So on the left is Uniswap, where, where I set up a trade. Um, and then I go and say swap. And up comes my wallet UI. And yep, at the end of the day, what's really happening is I'm sending money to a random number. And I hope that something happens at the other end that is actually what I intended and is good for me. And I get some money in some one of my accounts at some point, And eventually, I'll go sniff around in an hour and see that, oh, yes, it all happened. Not a great user experience. We've been working on, we've seen smart contract user interfaces. And if you think about some of the polish of these payment instruments that have a trusted third party, we have a long way to go. Okay? And we have a long way to go, not just in, you know, not in CSS styles, but in the structure and the pattern of how we interact with these things. So what do we want to see instead? Let's take our, our, our simple wallet example. On the left is our Uniswap equivalent, where I don't know if you can see it, but that's trading not just you know, moolah for simoleons, but moolah out of my, um, my savings account to trade to get simoleons and put it into my marketing operations account. And what that turns into is not send some money to a random number. It turns into an expression of the actual interaction, the actual multi-party interaction that I want. Right? Contracts are not about what I do. They're about what I do and what you do and what some third party does and, and the obligations and rewards and participation, the quid pro quo. Right? So what we, what we want and what we built is an architecture where what I do is not sign a payment to a random number. What I sign is an offer. Here's what I'm putting on the table and offering. Here's what I want in exchange for it. Here's the actual assets that underlie that. And, and I'm only going to give you those assets if you, if you give me what I want. Right? And you can see that expression there. And we'll come back to that. OK. 
So Zoe is what we call this system. We are at testnet now, so you can't use it yet until you come to the hackathon tonight. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Um, and, and so let me, let me talk a little bit about that. So let me walk you through this here. Um, at, at the top, let's say a seller wants to sell a concert ticket in you know, a digital good, a digital concert ticket in an auction. So it's not that they're somehow embedded in the auction. They're a participant where they're the seller. So they create an offer, which is, hey, I've got a concert ticket, and I want at least uh, X moolah for it. Right? So that's a, a reserve price, if you will. The client, the bidders, of which there may be multiple, those bidders offer at most Y moolah for that concert ticket. And now it's up to the smart contract to figure out, of the many bidders, which one gets it. <laughs> so when those offers are made, they don't go, the assets underlying it don't go to the smart contract itself. They go into an offer pool that Zoe is holding in escrow for, on behalf of the contract. So now, I don't have to ha trust the contract. I, as a bidder, don't have to trust the contract with my assets. I'm handing them to Zoe. Zoe is holding on to them. And then the contract will figure, the contract knows uh, what offers are available. And when the contract executes, it then tells Zoe, OK, reallocate the provided assets. Reallocate the combination of monies from various bidders and tickets from various sellers into something that achieves my contract goal. So in particular, that's the highest bidder. Give, give that bidder the concert ticket. Take the money from him that is you know, whatever number is appropriate. Hand that to the seller. That's the reallocation I want to do. And what Zoe then does is it, it executes that reallocation if and only if it satisfies the offer constraints, satisfies the rules, the terms that the bidders, or all the market participants, the seller as well, satisfies the terms that they said um, that were, were required before they would release their funds. Right? So I'm going to bid three moolah for that ticket. I'm only going to give it to you if you give me a ticket. And Zoe will make sure of that. And then Zoe provides the payouts, the winnings to the winner, and the refunds to all the losing bidders. Now, if you've ever seen um, uh, Solidity by example, there's a very early example of an auction where it starts out with some security goo that, that we don't need. It then has the auction, which is sort of the important part. And then it has a bunch of code for carefully returning the, the assets to the loser. And there are many hazards where if you do that wrong, someone else can steal all the money, or the loser doesn't get their money back, or whatever it is. And that's one of those things where, with this kind of architecture, that's simply off the table. And we'll talk a little bit about that. OK. So this achieves what we call offer safety. In software, right, the history of software engineering is in some sense a history of increasing safety properties. Concurrency safety, type safety, memory safety. And, and what happens with those safety properties is not that all bugs, are, all bugs evaporate, that all bugs are fixed. But it is that, you know, 80% of your buffer overruns and, and, and null pointer exceptions and so forth, they're just gone, right? When you have memory safety, they're just gone, right? And you still have a remaining set of bugs that you have to get correct, so it's not, you know, it, 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 it's not, it, it doesn't solve everything. But being able to take a big chunk of bugs off the table is an enormous improvement in the correctness of systems. And so offer safety is like that. It's the first of a few safety properties which I'll talk about, and where offer safety provides to clients the assurance that either they will get their desired winnings, the, a payout of their concert ticket, or they will get a refund of the assets they put on the table. Right? And it won't be that, oh, a bug in the program. I'm sorry. All the money's gone. I don't have any money to pay you. No, no. The contract never got the money. The only way the contract got the money is if, they, if, it, is if it provided the, 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 the winnings that the, um, uh, the, the client offering wanted. And so the client was going to be happy if that happens. Right? And then to the contract, it assures that the assets on offer are synchronously available. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the asynchronous world that the, the, that the blockchain world is starting to move into. But fundamentally, it knows that when it gets told of an offer, the assets are available, they're synchronously available. The assets that are available match the description. So, you know, I said there's four quatloos, by gosh, there's four quatloos. 
Um, and assuming I do a rearrangement, the assets um, of that rearrangement will be delivered on execution. No, no third party code will be able to interfere with my getting the money that I'm supposed to get out of this. Those are all really useful and simplifying uh, uh, consequences that, I, you know, if I can just rely on that, then I don't have a bunch of error handling, I don't have a bunch of complex use cases that I have to understand when writing these, these smart contracts. Okay, so in March of 2018, a paper came out um, uh, where they did a static analysis of a whole lot of Ethereum contracts and identified, in this case, 34,200 34, um, uh, contracts that had one of these three vulnerabilities, where you know, greedy means money goes in and it doesn't come out, you know, which is a great, great work if you can get it. Prodigal means that money goes in and someone not part of the contract can abscond with it. So you know, if someone absconds with the money I gave to the auctioneer, that means I'm not going to be able to give it back to the losers, because the auctioneer simply doesn't have it. Right? And then suicidal means that money goes in and then the contract dies and nobody gets their money back. And, um, there, you know, and, and you know, some of the instances of these are very well known and cost tens of millions of dollars or in some cases hundreds of millions of dollars. Right? And so th we can, with, sim with just this first market safety property, th for this first property of offer safety, prodigal is taken care of. Right? No one, if I put in a bid, is going to run off with my money unless they give me the concert ticket. Right, the quid pro quo. But the others need a little bit more. So let's talk about that extra little bit more that they need. It's what we call exit safety, where I put my money in and you can, you know, uh, I, I, you can either execute it and give me what I want, give me my money back, but the one thing you can't do is turn into a zombie and never talk to me and now you're sitting on my money. And there are literally hundreds of millions of dollars stuck in contracts where people would like to get the money back, but because of a bug, they can't get it. Right? And so, there are the, so, so the exit safety for any given offer is what's the criteria on which I get to terminate this offer, right? You know, if you, house offers are I'm willing to pay this much for a house as long as you get back to me by Thursday. So on demand is the person giving the offer can simply say, no, no, I'm done. Give me back my money. I, I, you know, you're taking too long, whatever it is. Um, and, but an important characteristic in order to actually have it be a safety property is that the contract that you're interacting with, which you may or may not trust, right? It might be an auctioneer. It might have been upgraded to something that wants to take my money and go on vacation, right? So I, don't I, I trust it to be an auctioneer, but I don't trust it to just be able to do whatever it wants with my money. So it must be the case that that code can't interfere with me telling Zoe, you know that offer that I'm allowed to revoke on demand? Yeah, I want it back now. And I don't want the, the contract going off and interfering with that. And so even if it goes into an infinite loop, even if it you, you know, wants to exhaust gas prices, even if it throws an exception, Zoe will get me my money back. So that's one. At deadline, you know, is, is I can't get my money back until after Tuesday. And after Tuesday, I can ask for it. But in an infrastructure where you want to be able to do DeFi, right, you can't do a covered call unless you can take the asset, commit it to a smart contract until next Tuesday, and then I can give a covered call that, that resolves um, uh, on Tuesday. Right? And so it's crucial that we have deadline-driven things. And our architecture of that is that the deadline is in terms of a time reference that is part of the contract. So it might be block height on the local contract, but our infrastructure is all, you know, is all about interop and our contracts will run across multiple machines and multiple chains. And so it might be in accordance with the block height of Ethereum, or it might be in accordance with the time as announced by a particular brokerage house on, you know, on Friday, or whatever the right time reference is, it's something that the bidders and the contract simply need to, need, need to have agreed on up front, and then we can do it very flexibly. And then finally, it's just up to the contract. Hey, I want it back, and the contract goes, yeah, okay, you can have it back. And, that, you know, and that's, that's the simplest one, obviously, that's not typical. But the most important one in order to, again, have a general safety architecture, or the hardest one to achieve, which is why it's not in our test net yet, um, is the one on failure, where, where you know, like with, with, with some of the bugs we've seen on Ethereum, where um, you know, the library was damaged, or the, the, the smart contract just had some, some operation that you just, you just can't, um, you know, just crashes every time you try and touch it. In those scenarios, it must be the case, again, that 
that the system will automatically be able to eject my offer, re refund my offers, without the correct execution of the underlying contract. So if it turfs, if it, you know, if it, if it crashes, I get my money back. It can't choose to crash in order to sit on my money until, you know, to give it a extended access uh, to my money. Okay. There we go. Um, so how does all, now that I've added that last wrinkle of exit, how does it all work, right? For when I construct an offer, I have my payout rules. The description of what I'm, excuse me, the description of what I'm willing to offer my four quatloos, up to four quatloos, um, and what I want, at least one concert ticket. And, um, or exactly one concert ticket, take a break, or perhaps, it, so, so uh, or exactly a concert ticket in seat E4, right? You know, so it can be a, a non-fudgeable good. The nice thing about this set of abstractions is, is, is the same tools, the same libraries, the same set of abstractions are generic across fungible and non-fungible uh, goods. So I provide, you know, what, I, what I'm offering, what I want, under what circumstances will this offer terminate, the exit rule, like the on-demand or, 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 or at a deadline. And then I have to actually provide a payment that matches the, the assets I've offered, right? I can't just say, oh, I've got four quatloos. The important thing about this to the, to the actual contracts is not only do I say I have four quatloos on offer, but they're actually there, right? I'm actually, uh, the contract is actually assured that it can get them, even though it can't, you know, currently touch them, right? It has to, it'll be able to get them if it, succeed, if it succeeds at satisfying the offer. And then what happens is the, the client gets back a receipt from Zoe saying, yep, everything's, everything's escrowed, um, which might be asynchronous, and we'll talk about that, and a promise for the payout, a promise that will resolve in the future once the contract has decided whether it's taken or, or, or rejected the offer and, and it's, it's satisfied with um, the winnings if that offer was accepted and satisfied or a refund if that offer was ejected without being satisfied. Now, it turns out you might get some of both, because remember, you know, this example of I'm offering up to four quat lose. If it only actually costs me three, then I get both a concert ticket as winnings and I get one quat lose back in change. And so that, so the same architecture covers both being completely ejected and not winning the auction and, and the, the, the partial kinds of payment. So what are the operations that Zoe provides? Now, normally I would have code, but this is a shorter talk here. Um, so, uh, so on the left we have what clients see outside of a contract is the ability to find contracts and validate that they're running the code you want, right? In, in systems like Ethereum, I can pretend that, okay, here's a random number, let me see what source code is at the other end. Okay, that's, the, you know, in this public display, I can see that, that the source code I would run if I sent money to that random number is this source code. But we span multiple chains, some are private, some are consortium, some might be zero knowledge in the future, that sort of thing. So a model where I just inspect from the outside as an oracle, you know, as, as, as a all-seeing eye, um, that's not a great model for the future of commerce. And so we want to be able to get that information from the authoritative source. We're relying on Zoe to handle our assets. It's also going to say, and if you send money, if you send an offer to this contract, here's the code it's going to run. And, you know, you don't even necessarily need, need to read the code, but you can strongly determine that, yep, that's the code that these security folks have blessed as, be, you know, having been reviewed or gone through whatever processes you need to go through. So, it gives me the trusted path. It does the escrow of offers where I can provide those assets and does all the escrow and provides the assurance to contracts uh, that they've been escrowed. It ensures that if I say, give me my money back, I get my money back. And then finally, it provides me the payout of, of either my money back or my winnings. For the contracts, this is the code now running in the contract, what's its perspective as running on top of Zoe? Well, the first is Zoe is the host for these contracts. It's, it's the platform on which these contracts run, and so that's how one can easily instantiate multiple instances of these, contra uh, instances of these contracts. It enables the, um, the, the, the contract code to react to offers. And there are various ways in which, we do, in which we do that. The primary one is, well, I just hand the code to the, hand the offer to the code that was written as, you know, arbitrary JavaScript code in our, in, 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 in our system um, that is the smart contract, and it can confirm with Zoe that indeed all the assets are available and proceed on the basis of that offer being real. And then finally, 
Zoe lets you reallocate assets. And that's you know, the key thing of reallocate assets consistent with all the offers and consistent with conservation of currency. And the nice thing about this abstraction is it lets us prove strong properties of all of that independent of the execution of the code, which means we can use programming languages that lots of programmers in the world are familiar with. And that's a really important, that's crucial from our perspective in terms of getting uh, uh, smart contracts to mainstream. Okay. So that was most of the fire hose. Couple, uh, now, normally I would have jumped into, 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 into um, uh, source code and showed examples and that sort of thing. But we don't have time for that now. But this infrastructure is um, uh, 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 part of the hackathon that starts tonight. And so if you want more detail, want to actually see the code, want to see the electronic rights transfer protocol that allows it to be abstracted across, um, uh, uh, that, that's all available tonight at the hackathon. Over the next couple of months, we will be improving the APIs based on our own experience, based on partners that are starting to build with it, hackathon feedback, your feedback, et cetera. And we know there are extensions that are already in progress and that we're interested in. Like I might say, okay, I'm willing to pay up to three quatloos per concert ticket, but I'd like up to five. Can you, you know, can you, can you hook me up with five of them? So that's a multiple. Or I want seat E4 or seat D3, but I don't really want any of the other seats that are available. Give me one of those two. So that's a that's a disjunction. The exit safety on crash that I mentioned that, that we know how to do but isn't currently implemented. And finally, those, those underlying protocols for electronic rights transfer that we've built all up in our, in our, in our runtime, which I, I, I encourage you to see other uh, um, recorded talks on the subject. We've got various extensions of that to, for example, support uh, what we call preemption hierarchies, right? If, if, if I buy a house, well, you know, the bank owns it, but I kind of own it, and then I, then I let my company run inside it, and they assign a desk to someone whose seat I borrow, right? Three, you know, several levels of hierarchy where at any one of those levels, you know, I, the putative owner, could tell the company to get out, and then the entire hier hierarchy underneath uh, goes away. Turns out, Ownership hierarchies show up in all sorts of goods, whether it's you know, house ownership or whether it's a game item, a magic sword that a guild has that it wants to loan to a party member that's going to go help with whatever uh, uh, magical combat they're doing. So these, these models show up in every use case across the, uh, across the, uh, the, the, the value of, of using smart contracts. And so that's something that we'll be adding generically. Um, so, the key thing that I wanted for this presentation, that if you, if you take, you know, for you to take away, is that the model of how we interact with these systems should not be in terms of sending money to a random number. It should be in terms of actually capturing what you're trying to accomplish in the thing that the human authorizes or in the thing that the contract authorizes and having a system that enforces that. So it shows up in the user interface. It changes our, our model of, a, of, of user interface where now the application is in some sense how I construct my proposal for an offer. It hands it over to the wallet, which is my trusted path to the user that safely presents the offer. And, um, uh, and, and, and that's a much stronger, more understandable general principle of user interface, but it doesn't just change that. It provides that offer safety that will protect clients from smart contract misbehavior systematically throughout the system. It'll simplify the smart contract implementation because there's a bunch of logistics and boilerplate that are just handled for them that are non-issues for them. And from our perspective, that ability to be safe from your smart contracts, to be able to easily use them because you know that your assets are protected at least up to the point of making sure you get what you want, that's crucial for being able to make a network of smart contracts where one contract builds on another, where we can have a covered call where the thing that is covered is a, a, for a concert ticket or some other smart contract itself. And the covered call is an asset that's sold in a market and bought by a program that puts it in a portfolio. And all the kinds of rich interactions that are required for an economy rather than little islands of functionality, which is what we currently have. And that's crucial to getting to the point of taking our, our, a lot of our economic activity, a lot of our decentralized cooperative activity, and getting it online in a centralized fashion. So thank you very much. <laughs> and we have a few minutes for questions, I think. 
So the question was, if you have a reference to, the, to a contract, can you re reflect on its properties or its state instead of just its source code? So the generic answer is yes, though in private context, there may be some limitation as to your ability to reflect on its internal state. But we were actually just talking about, you know, I'm already asking Zoe, what is this thing that I'm talking to? So one of the kinds of, of, of metadata you can already get are, what are the terms of the contract? You know, yes, I understand it's an exchange, but what are the assays that it will validate that it is you know, from Quatloos to Simoleons? Or what is the assay that, that with which I will verify that the thing someone sends me is actually a concert ticket that they bought in this market and not something they made up? And so there are meta properties already, and that's a, that's a natural place to extend those and provide that kind of introspection. So the question was, how do you handle a, 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 an, an offer or an escrow if the thing that you're buying is a subscription or some long-lived thing? Um, so that's a great question, and uh, some of that we will, we, will, um, we will implement new offer structures in order to, to be able to do it. It is crucial from my perspective to have these long-lived contracts that have terms over time. Being able to have a, where I'm purchasing a subscription object, now I'm, uh, that's a, in some sense, one-time thing, where I just am going through a process and the asset I'm going to get back is the front end of a contract, which is a subscription object that I can ask for something each month. But there is, you know, I use the example of a covered call, that's a, that's a contract where the, Having the object of this thing that will execute over time is itself an asset, and in our architecture, I mentioned ERTP, the Electronic Rights Transfer Protocol, there is the ability to write an assay that will be able to say, is this actually a subscription that will execute over time, and, and are there at least eight months left on it? If so, that's now a digital good that can participate on, in all of these markets. And so in that scenario, um, th th there are, in that scenario, I can protect the sale of that, the, there are um, some limitations, you know, in, in the case of an auction, um, I, can't, I get offer safety to make sure I'm not paying more than I'm willing to pay, but there's a separation of concerns where the offer safety does not ensure that the auctioneer doesn't sell it to the second highest bidder instead of the first highest bidder. So it doesn't ensure that it's not a bad auctioneer. And so in some of these cases, we know how to have offer safety for some of it, and the rest of it you're still relying on the correctness of the contract. And over time we will add richer, you know, time domain safety properties, for example, that might be able to better capture that. All right. Thank you all.